<clears throat> Martin Luther said that the Christian life is like a drunk man riding a horse. That you fall to one side and you pull yourself up and you fall to the other side. Now, as we've been going through our guilt series, it might seem like we're leaning very hard towards one side, where I've been telling you, you are not guilty. There is no condemnation for you. And that can certainly be abused, can it? Many people have an idea that we can be what's called entirely sanctified. Has anybody ever heard of that, entire sanctification? One time, Callie and I, um, I was coming home from work, and I rode the bus, and Callie met me at the bus stop, and we were walking home, and there was a man who was evangelizing. And I use that term loosely, because evangelizing normally means that you preach a message of the gospel. This man, however, was preaching uh, entire sanctification. He told me, not that I needed to be saved, he told me that I needed to be entirely sanctified. And I asked him what that meant, and he said, that means that God cleanses you from all of your sin, and you no longer sin. And I said, so are you entirely sanctified? And he said, yes. And I said, well, when's the last time you sinned? And he said, December of 2013. Now, mind you, this was September of 2016. And so I said, so you haven't sinned in, in almost three years then? He said, no, I haven't. And I said, well, I guess that makes, I didn't say this, but I thought, well, I guess that makes three years for you in three seconds for me <laughs> because I scoffed at your baloney story. Another person told D.L. Moody that I can't remember the last time I sinned. And D.L. Moody said, well, I'd like to hear a testimony from your wife. <laughs> because the reality is we all sin. And so the drunk person riding a horse illustration, sometimes we, we just don't care about sin. Sometimes we go, oh, it's just not that big of a deal anymore, and we don't have to worry about it. And sometimes we get so wrapped up in our sin, and we need to be reminded that we're not guilty. And so my purpose for you for the last few weeks, and for myself as well, is to remind you that you are not guilty, but this morning I'm hoping we can balance out the other side of the equation and show that we certainly will sin, and we can't um, treat that flippantly. And so this will be the last week in our guilt series, and we'll be getting back into Mark next week. So the book of Romans is probably the most exhaustive rehearsal of the gospel in all of Scripture. Paul spends chapters upon chapters explaining that Jesus did the work for us, and that it, we're saved by the works of Jesus and not by our own works. And, and the point of Romans is to show you that God can justify you and me freely while not becoming a corrupt judge himself. God is both just and justifier. He's not a crooked judge who just lets criminals off, but our sins indeed get punished. And so the purpose of Romans is to show you that God judges your sins on Jesus and justifies you freely. Justifying meaning that he pronounces you righteous. He declares you to be in a right standing with him. He declares you to be innocent. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, There was no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so throughout the book of Romans, Paul deals frequently with the topics of guilt and innocence, which we are interested in our series for the last couple of weeks. And so uh, the main point is to show you that God can justify you, but also Paul spends a lot of time saying that your life should look a certain way as a result of that truth. One of the objections that Paul heard frequently throughout his ministry, one of the objections that you and I have heard is, if we're saved by grace, if we're saved for, by, for free, if it's a free gift, does that mean that we can just go on doing whatever we want as if nothing has happened? Does that mean that nothing changes for us? And the answer is a resounding no. And you and I saw last week in Ephesians chapter 2 that grace brings with it an implicit obligation. And so I've been warning you throughout the weeks that it's going to sound like I'm writing you a blank check, but this morning I'm hoping that we can balance the scales. We come to chapter 6, where in chapter 5, Paul has been drawing a parallel between Adam and Jesus. Paul says that in Adam, one man brought sin and death to all people. Through one act of disobedience, sin and death entered the world. That doesn't jive with evolution, by the way. 
On the other side, he says that Jesus, in the same way, by obedience and righteousness of one person, life and forgiveness and innocence was brought to all of his people. And so Adam brought death to all his people, and Jesus brought life to all of his people. And so G uh, Paul is drawing this, this contrast and this parallel between those two figures. But Paul, you can look with me at chapter 5, verse 20, says something very bold. Paul says in 5, verse 20, that the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That is a bold claim. To say that God forgives people, and, and the more sinful a person is, when God forgives them, that makes his grace look all the better. That's what we saw in Ephesians chapter 2. And so there's an objection that Paul anticipates after he makes such a bold claim. After Paul has been, has been explaining how it is that we can be sinful and yet God can forgive us and, and remain just himself, he anticipates an objection probably something that he heard a lot during his ministry talking to Jewish people. Uh, it's probably something he heard a lot talking to Greeks. It's something that you and I hear when we talk to the LDS community or the Catholic community. They say, okay, you can just be saved by grace, so, so should we just go on continuing to do what we were doing before? In fact, Martin Lloyd-Jones says, if you hear that objection, that might be a sign that you're preaching the gospel right, because that's the reaction that Paul got is that he leaned so hard towards grace that people thought, well, hold on now. Let me, let me ask you a question here. And so Paul is going to deal with that question of shall we continue on in sin that grace may abound? This is, can, this is pertinent to our uh, guilt series because we have to ask the question, if we're not guilty anymore, then what kind of life should we live? And, and again, the balance is not to say that we can't sin anymore, not to say that there's nothing we can do wrong anymore. And on the other side, to realize that God declaring us innocent should affect the way that we live. So read with me in verses 1 through 14. Romans 6, 1. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, or <clears throat> how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace." We'll have a three-part outline this morning. In verses 1 through 4, we'll see an introduction. Paul raises the question, he answers the question, and he introduces uh, why the question isn't a, is not a, a legitimate uh, um, objection to raise against the gospel. And then in verses 5 through 10, we will see an explanation. We'll see Paul uh, expounding on what he asserts in verses 1 through 4. And it is a deep and profound and complicated rehearsal of the gospel and what it means for us to be united to Christ. He explains why it is that we are dead to sin. And then in verses 11 through 14, there will be an application. He will turn and tell you where the rubber meets the road. Okay, Jesus died. You're united to Jesus. Therefore, this is what you should do. So we'll have an introduction, an explanation, and an application.
And so we begin in verses 1 through 4 uh, with the introduction. <laughs> Verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? That is the objection that would have been raised by his audience or by people in his community. And he, res- he, he responds with the most powerful language available to him in verse 2. He says, by no means. It is the most emphatic way that he can say, no, we do not continue on in sin. No way. But then he makes an assertion. He says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Calvin, commenting on this passage, says that it would be a most strange inversion of the work of God were sin to gather strength on account of the grace which is offered to us in Christ. For medicine is not the feeder of the disease which it destroys. Paul say, or excuse me, Calvin says that the gospel is like medicine to the disease of sin. And so, yes, the medicine is powerful enough to overcome the disease, and that means that the disease should die out. And so we don't continue on in sin because the gospel combats against our sin. Now, again, to not abuse this passage, John Stott says, it is not the literal impossibility of sin in believers which Paul is declaring, but the moral incongruity of it. I'm going to expound more on this in a little bit, but it doesn't mean that you and I don't sin anymore. But it means that it is a cognitive dissonance. It means that we are acting inconsistently with what we profess to believe. If we say that the gospel combats sin, then we should show that in our lives with the death of sin. And so the gospel is the medicine that combats sin in our lives. Now, Paul makes this assertion. He answers the question, no way, but he begins to make an assertion by asking him the question, how can we who died to sin still live in it? One way for us to understand Romans chapter 6 is is for us to take his questions and just rephrase them in the form of a sentence. Instead of asking the question, how can we who died to sin still live in it, let let me flip it for you and say it this way. We died to sin. We can no longer continue on in it. We died to sin. We no longer live in it. Now, you remember with me from Ephesians chapter 2 that we were once in slavery to sin. We were once in slavery and in subjection to the devil. We were following the course of this world. We were children of wrath. But Paul tells us that when we encountered Christ, when we heard the gospel, when we believed in him, we died. We died a death of sorts. Now, let me tell you what that doesn't mean. When I tell you that you're dead to sin, I don't mean that you are no longer susceptible to sin. And some people would have you believe that. Some people have suggested that Christians can't sin anymore because their sins are forgiven. And so whatever Christians do wrong, it's not a sin, it's just a mistake. Some people have suggested things like that. Um, Other people have suggested things like the entire sanctification that I um, told you about just a second ago. That is a silly and an unbiblical conclusion. We're going to come back to 1 John chapter 1, but John says this, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. And so when Paul tells you that you're dead to sin, he's not saying you'll never sin again. He's saying that your relationship to sin has fundamentally changed. We'll come to the end of verse 14 where it says that it has no dominion over us. It's not the boss anymore. I used an illustration with you a couple of weeks ago and I said if you brought alcohol to a dead alcoholic at his funeral, how would he respond? He wouldn't. And then I found out right after that that people use that illustration to say that we're not responsive to the stimulus of sin anymore. That is, we're no longer tempted. Or if we are tempted, that we no longer respond to it at all anymore. We're not weak. We're not threatened by it anymore. That that was not my intention in sharing that illustration with you. My intention was simply to tell you that when you died to sin, it simply means that your relationship to change, your relationship to sin is no longer what it was. You were once in slavery. You were once in subjection. Paul says, you died, and you no longer live in sin. Now notice that. He says in verse 2, we can't live in it anymore. Actually, let me ask you, what doesn't Paul say here? Paul doesn't say, how can we who died to sin still sin occasionally? Paul doesn't say, how can we who died to to sin still slip and fall? How can we who died to sin ever sin even one time ever again? Is that what Paul says? No. Paul says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? 
It is no longer the way to characterize our life the way that it was before. It's no longer the fundamentally driving force. It is no longer the reason we get up in the morning. It's no longer the primary appetite that we're seeking to satisfy. We are still vulnerable to sin. We are still very much threatened by it and susceptible to it. But our relationship to it has changed. It is no longer master over us. Verse 3 answers the question. Paul says, you died to sin. You might ask the question, when did I die? I don't remember dying. When did that happen? Paul continues in verse 3. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Again, take the question out of that. He says, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. The reason he asks the question is for rhetorical force. Don't you know this? Like Jesus saying to the Pharisees, haven't you read? But, but this, the assertion here is that when we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. That means we died when we came to know Jesus. Some of you might focus in on that word baptism and say, whoa, hold on, is Paul saying that when I was literally physically dunked into water, that's when, I was, that's when I died to sin? No. When Paul says baptism here, he's not referring to water baptism. Paul is referring to conversion. Baptism is used in the New Testament many times to refer to your conversion. And so Paul is saying when you were converted, when you came to know Jesus, that was your baptism, that's when you died. There are some people who would say that you're not saved until you literally get baptized. You're not regenerated until you literally get baptized. That is heresy. That is adding a work to the gospel. That is telling you that you have to do something in order to be saved. Paul is saying that when you came to know Jesus, you died. Now, water baptism is a ceremony of that. Water baptism represents that. But Paul is saying, when you came to know Jesus, you died. Now, we ask the question, how does that work? What do you mean we died? I don't remember dying. I don't remember my body dying and being raised. Verse 4 continues. He says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. <clears throat> he says that Jesus died and was resurrected. We died and we were resurrected. Now, we are still awaiting the day when we die and are physically resurrected in our bodies. That hasn't happened yet. But what Paul is saying is your old nature died and your soul was raised in a new nature. And that someday your body will die and you will be raised in glory just like Jesus. But what he's saying is the glory of the Father raised Jesus from the grave. The glory of the Father also killed your old nature and raised your nature anew. And you are now a new person, a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. You are no longer the same person that you once were. That person is dead. Your old nature is dead. You are gone. You are a new person, a new creation. Many commentators and scholars have noted that the gospel is not just a gospel of forgiveness. Grace doesn't just forgive us. Grace transforms us. The gospel isn't just about wiping your slate clean so that you can call it good on Judgment Day and live however you want. The gospel is about giving you a new quality of life now. Titus chapter 2 says that the grace of God appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Paul says there that the gospel came to train us to live a new quality of life. Now, what Paul says about training in, Ch in Titus 2. He says about empowering in Romans 6. You're not just trained to do the right things. You're not just trained about what your life should look like. You're also empowered. The glory of the Father raised Jesus from the grave. The glory of the Father kills your old nature and raises it anew. Notice that in verse 4. He says that we were buried so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. This is happening so that you and I will have a new quality of life now. So in the bigger picture of Romans, in the bigger picture of our guilt series, we ask the question, why is the gospel not just a blank check to sin? Because the gospel is the very medicine that combats sin. The gospel is the very thing that kills sin in you. The gospel is the very thing that gives you a new life now. Many of you have probably heard of this illustration. 
the punishment, the power, and the presence of sin. The gospel got rid in the past of the punishment of sin. The punishment of sin is gone. The gospel is delivering us from the power of sin. Sin no longer has dominion over us, and we are being delivered from the power of sin. God will deliver us from the presence of sin in the future. And so the punishment, the power, and the presence of sin. Now, as we continue, Paul just keeps to raise questions because we have to keep asking, how does that work? Okay, you're telling me that I died to sin, but how? There was nothing traumatic that happened in my life. I didn't go into a coma. Um, I, I've, yeah, it seems like things are a little bit different now, but you're making these, these bold assertions about things like me dying. How does that work? As verses 5 through 10 continue, Paul begins to explain how that works. Paul tells you, notice this in verse 5, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, I'm, I'm going to abbreviate my sermon because if you can't tell, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time with my voice here, so forgive me, have mercy on me, but I'm going to try and, and explain this to you as simply as possible. Hone in on that word, united. That word united means nature. That word united is similar to the word grafted, joined into. And so if I could simplify Paul's explanation in verses 5 through uh, 10, it's this. Jesus died. You're united to Jesus. Therefore, you died. Because you are united to Christ, what's true of Jesus is true of you. It says things like, the one who has died has been set free from sin. You say, well, who died? Jesus died, but because you are united to Jesus, you also died. Jesus is set free from sin, not his own sin, not the punishment for his own sin, but the punishment from your sin because he made that payment. He died, the punishment is gone because it's been paid for, it's been satisfied, and because you are united to Christ, you are justified from sin. You are freed from sin because he made the payment for you. Your debt has been paid. Your debt is gone. And so Paul's explanation, if you boil it down, is that you have been united to Christ. And so that makes what's true of Jesus true of you in the gospel sense. John Calvin commenting on this passage, he said that um, it, it's like the grafting of branches onto a tree. He brings up the grafting into Israel in chapters 10 and 11, I think. Um, <clears throat> he talks about how we're grafted into Israel, we're grafted into Jesus. And he said, in the case of grafting branches, a branch receives its, uh, its nourishment from the tree, but it still, be it still continues to bear its own fruit. It still continues to bear the fruit of its own nature. But he said what Jesus does for us is when he grafts us in, we don't continue to bear our own fruit. We receive our nourishment from him and actually the branch begins to bear new fruit because of the miraculous supernatural power of the gospel. And so we've been united, we have a new nature, and specifically in this case, we bear the fruits of death and resurrection. We bear the fruit of death to sin, we bear the fruit of life in the newness of life towards God in Christ Jesus. Verse 6 says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. One pastor that I heard commenting on this passage one time, explaining this passage one time, he says that the, the closest we can get to an illustration is the power of attorney. You know, when, when, you, when somebody signs the power of attorney over to you and you can legally act on that person's behalf, Jesus has the power of attorney over us, except it's even more profound than us. And so when Jesus was crucified, our old self was crucified with him. And so why don't we sin anymore? Why is it not just a blank check? It's because we died. It's because we are united to Christ. And so in, in an ironic way, Paul is saying, you died, therefore die. <laughs> He's stating the facts. You see, this isn't just about commanding. Many people, and, and, and Christians too, we get so wrapped up in commands. Tell me what to do. Paul's not always interested in telling you what to do. Paul sometimes is just interested in telling you about the way things are. And so Romans 6 very much is a you should do this. But it also is also very indicative. When I say indicative, I mean a statement of the facts. Paul isn't just saying, stop doing that. He's saying, you're dead. This is the way that it is now. It's not just about me commanding you. It's about the way things are moving forward. It's because of your new nature as you are united to Christ. 
verses 7 through 9 are, are very repetitive of what we already said, so I'm not really going to touch on them. Let's read them quickly. Uh, For the one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And now he's going to apply it in verses 11 through 14 and say, consider yourself to be in that same place because you are, because you are united to Christ. And so look with me at verses 11 through 14 as we look at the application. The application is where the rubber meets the road. You see, people like to compartmentalize Christian doctrine from Christian ethics. They like to say that theology is this nice, abstract philosophy that we can talk about, and and nerds like to talk about it, and and that's great, but you need to tell me some ethics, and you need to tell me what to do, and and they put uh, theology and ethics in different compartments. But what Paul does consistently, and what the New Testament does consistently, is it says that our ethics are based on our doctrine. And Paul gives us a complicated theological rehearsal of the gospel, and it's pointed towards a practical end. Theology is very practical, and we see that through the New Testament. And so Paul he goes through his theology in verses uh, 5 through 10, but now in verses 11 through 14, he gets very practical. Read verses 11 through 14. He says, So also you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Notice verse 11, the first application that Paul gives is mental. He says, consider yourselves dead to sin. Consider yourselves alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is a very, the Christian life is a mental life. It's not a mindless life. It's not an assembly line. It's not rote. He's saying you must think a certain way and your life will not change until you begin to think a certain way. So you need to think about yourself in line with the gospel truth about yourself. Something has been accomplished. Your mind needs to meet up with that. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So the first application Paul gives is mental. How can you change the way that you live? How can the gospel continue to grow you even more and more? Well, you need to start thinking differently. When you're presented with temptation, when you're in a trial, when you're dealing with a person who's frustrating you, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Consider yourself dead. It is mental. Now, verse 12 continues. He says, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Now he says, Don't allow it. Don't let it be your king anymore. It's not in charge. You can't just allow things to go on as they were when you were once under the authority of sin. Don't let things continue on the way that they were before. There there should be a change. There should be a marked difference. Notice also, he doesn't say, again, that you will never sin again. He says it's something that can't reign over you and make you obey its passions. He doesn't say you'll never sin again. He says you have to keep it from reigning over you. Again, there's the balance. We can't treat sin flippantly, but we can't be surprised when we do sin, because all of us do. So he says, let not sin reign, therefore. It is not your king anymore. Verse 13 continues, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. If If verse 13 tells you that sin isn't king, or excuse me, if verse 12 tells you that sin isn't king anymore, then verse 13 tells you that it's not your general. It can't command you. In fact, you can observe this word. It says don't present your members to sin as instruments. That word instruments, hone in on that. That word instrument actually means weapons. And the only English translation um, that I know of that translates as as weapons is the Holman Christian Standard Bible. So Nola just got a new HDSB and she's like, I know, yep, I got it right. Don't present your body parts 
as weapons of Satan's army anymore. That's what they used to be. They used to be instruments of unrighteousness. They used to be weapons of wickedness. But now Paul says, sin isn't your king. Sin isn't your general. Your body is no longer property of the satanic army. Your body is now property of God. Your members, your body parts, they are now the weapons of God's spiritual warfare. You notice also that he, he draws a little bit of a contrast here because he says, don't present your members, but then he continues and he says, present yourselves. Notice, he doesn't just say that your members are God's property. He says, your whole self is God's property. It's everything about you that now belongs to him. That's why in Romans 12, he says, offer yourselves as living sacrifices because that's what you are. You're no longer your own property. Your whole self, your whole body is now his property. Let me ask you, when is the last time you considered yourself dead to sin? When is the last time that we considered ourselves alive to righteousness? When is the last time we realized we could say no to sin? Do you know that? We can say no to sin. It's not our boss anymore. What amazing good news that Jesus could affect in us, that he would give us authority to not sin. Now, it doesn't mean we won't ever sin again, because we will, but we don't have to. And the power of the gospel is that you have a new nature that now is no longer under the authority of sin. And that's how Paul can conclude in verse 14. He says, sin will have no dominion over you. You are no longer under law, but under grace. Now, that whole idea of not being under law, but under grace, that's a conversation for another day. Paul spends a lot of time under what being under the law and under grace means throughout the rest of Romans. And if you're interested, then go ahead and read the rest of Romans and let me know what you find. But we're not going to discuss that here today. Allow me to conclude with an illustration from Martin Lloyd-Jones. <coughs> Martin Lloyd-Jones, <coughs> speaking allegorically, said that there were two fields with a little road in the middle. There's, there's a road and there's a field on each side. And one field belongs to Satan and one field belongs to Jesus. And he said, from the time that I was born... I was employed and enslaved to the field that belonged to Satan. I was there for a long time. I served a tyrannical master for a long time. And he said at some point in his life, he heard the gospel, he was, his chains were broken, he was purchased from the field of Satan, and he was employed in the field next door. And the problem was that he could still hear the commands of Satan coming from that other field next door. He said, even though I'm not, I don't work there anymore, even though he's not my boss anymore, I still hear him calling across the way to tell me what to do. And he says, I always seem to have a hard time because I keep hearing Satan across the road yelling orders at me. And though I'm not under his dominion, he has a very clever way of making me interested in what he's asking me to do. That's our life. We are no longer employed or enslaved in his field. We are now across the road and we still hear his commands. And because we worked for him for so long, we are still uh, so susceptible and so easily uh, deceived into doing what we did before. But we need to realize that we are no longer employed in that field, that we are now under new management, that we now belong to Jesus. Turn with me to 1 John. We come to 1 John because it's uh, very similar to giving us a balance of what we've been trying to communicate. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. It says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Do you see that? You cannot treat sin flippantly. You cannot claim to have fellowship with the Father. You cannot, have fel you cannot claim to have fellowship with the God who is light, and yet walk in darkness. 
You like that illustration, light and darkness? You can't be in both at the same time. Light overcomes the darkness. And you cannot claim to be in the light if you're walking in darkness. And so John here tells us you cannot treat sin flippantly. If you have fellowship with the Father, then your walk will be consistent and it will be changed by that. But notice also, he continues, he says in verse 7, or in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You see that? Even though John tells us we need to be walking in the light, he also tells us we can't deceive ourselves by saying that we don't have sin. We walk in the light and yet we stumble. And so we need to have a biblical balance. Verse 9 continues, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus is the cure for our stumbling into sin. Verse 10, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Don't pretend you don't sin. Don't pretend you don't have sin in your life. But also don't treat sin flippantly. It's the drunk man riding the horse. It's really hard to get that balance and we fall from one side to the other and back and forth and back and forth and that is the Christian life. But the balance is acknowledge that we all have sin and yet don't let it reign over you as Paul said in Romans 6. It is not your master. And so we come to the end of our guilt series where I've sought to tell you and remind you that you are not guilty. There is no condemnation for you but that doesn't mean that you don't sin anymore. I've also sought to tell you that you just can't be bossed around by your guilt complex anymore. It can't tell you what to do. We saw that in Colossians chapter 2. We saw in Ephesians, in Ephesians 2 that we, we can be honest about our past. We can say clearly and boldly the things that we used to do because they actually now magnify God's glory. We say, God forgave a wicked sinner like me. That shows how kind he is. And so we've seen that our guilt has been repurposed. We've also seen that grace uh, is an obligation to us, that grace uh, tells us that we need to live a new character of life, and we've seen this morning that we are dead to sin. And so keep that balance in mind. You are not guilty, and that should make a difference in your life. But also, you need to acknowledge that in immediate circumstantial situational senses, you can incur guilt. There's one verse that I was trying to work into the series and I couldn't do it, so this is going to seem awkward, but there is one verse in the New Testament that speaks of a believer being guilty. And that's in Galatians chapter 2. Paul says that he conf confronted Peter to his face because he stood condemned. And so in a situational sense, we can incur, incur guilt by doing stupid things. But Paul tells us, you are not guilty, and that should affect the way that you live. Let's pray.